Hello, everyone. It's great to be with you this morning. I am excited and looking forward to today's event, which is titled Africa Engineers the Future, building on 10 years of Africa-UK engineering collaboration. My name is Terry ann Chibet, and I'm your host for the day, and I'm excited about conversations that move Africa forward, and I am looking forward to all the insights, the debates, and deliberations that will take place throughout the day. Before we begin, you may wish to watch in full screen mode. Uh, you can do this by clicking on the maximize screen icon. That's, that will be on the bottom right um, hand corner of this video. Uh, to come out in full screen mode, you can also click on the same icon. A little note, I uh, would love you to be part of an, the online conversation as well. Uh, please share your experiences about today's event on your socials. The hashtag we'd like you to use is Africa Showcase. And remember to tag um, at Rain Global. That's R hyphen A hyphen E hyphen N hyphen G um, hyphen Global. That's Rain Global. And the hashtag is Africa Showcase. Now, alongside the event, you'll also be able to explore an online exhibition that showcases up to 100 individuals and institutions that have been supported by the Academy. This include entrepreneurs, researchers, universities, and professional engineering bodies representing about 30 countries from numerous sectors across the continent. This platform will be available for viewing until Sunday, the 6th of March, 2022. Now, let me tell you a little bit about why today's event is important. Back in 2012, the Academy, in collaboration with partners, uh, published the Engineers for Africa report, which focused on engineering capacity needs in sub-Saharan Africa. This report informed the Academy on how it could best support sustainable engineering for development um, on the African continent. And 10 years on, we want to pause and reflect on these initiatives and draw lessons and insights for the next decade. We'll hear more about the programs that stemmed from the report uh, from our panelists this morning. I am delighted to say that the first two speakers were actually involved in the writing um, of the Engineers for Africa report and are the best people to set the scene for this morning's session. Let me welcome Dr. Hayatun Salim. Uh, she's the Chief Executive Royal Academy of Engineering and Chief Executive of the Queen Elizabeth Prize for Engineering Foundation. She'll tell us a little bit about today's event. Dr. Sile. about 10 years since the publication of the Engineers for Africa report. And to have this opportunity to reflect on the progress that's been made since then to position engineering at the heart of sustainable development in Africa. And I would like to say a particular thank you to Peter Matthews, Executive Director of Engineers Against Poverty, who I had the great pleasure of working closely with when we published that first report, and to Professor Funmi Oloni Sarkin, Vice President and Professor of Security, Leadership and Development at King's College London for joining us today and being part of this event. The Academy has long believed that engineering is a fundamental enabler of development and that building engineering capacity is essential to support socioeconomic growth and development in many countries, including in sub-Saharan Africa. To use one of my favorite definitions of this profession, engineers make things, they make things work and they make things work better. Engineers use creativity and innovation to provide solutions to societal challenges. And sufficient numbers of engineers with the right skills are essential to providing sustainable solutions that can help livelihoods across Africa and build resilience, which in turn supports inclusive economic growth. So looking back to a decade ago when I had fewer gray hairs and we had never heard of COVID-19, I had the privilege of helping to set up the Africa-UK Engineering for Development Partnership, our collaboration with the Africa Engineers Forum, now the Federation of African Engineering Organizations, Engineers Against Poverty, and the Institution of Civil Engineers in the UK. 
And in conjunction with this, in 2012, we published Engineers for Africa, identifying engineering capacity needs in sub-Saharan Africa, which really highlighted, it shone a light on quite how severe the shortage of engineering skills was across a range of disciplines. With an estimated 2.5 million new engineers needed to meet the UN Sustainable Development Goals and fewer than 10% of engineers in sub-Saharan Africa being women, the Academy has subsequently been working hard with our fantastic partners to do what we can to bridge these gaps together, to drive engineering innovation, to unify our profession and to advance quality engineering education through our Africa programmes. The Higher Education Partnerships in Sub-Saharan Africa programme, or HEP-SSA, has since 2013 supported over 500 academia industry part, uh, placements rather, and over 50 revisions to, and in some cases, the creation of individual course curricula. The Africa Prize for Engineering Innovation has since 2014 supported 118 innovators in 18 countries, contributing to the creation of 1,500 jobs, of which over 50% are for women and 25% for youth, and directly addressing 12 of the 17 UN SDGs. And our GCR Africa Catalyst programme has, since 2016, supported the training of over 2,000 engineers by professional engineering bodies. And importantly, Africa Catalyst has also encouraged more women to pursue engineering careers, which is a shared challenge and priority across the UK and African engineering professions. And one example of this is provided by our colleagues at the Institute of Engineers Rwanda, who increased the number of female internship applicants from 15% in just one year to 25% the following year. In addition, during the pandemic, the Academy mobilised over 50 expert volunteers to support engineering entrepreneurs in 11 African countries to address the impacts of COVID-19 that have been felt so severely right around the world. Through Project CARE, we were able to support the African engineers in our network in their response to the COVID-19 pandemic, including by manufacturing personal protective equipment or PPE, a phrase we've come to know very well, for health workers and the public. Over 52,000 units of PPE were locally manufactured to sell to private clinics, businesses, shops and households, and over 34,000 units were gifted to hospitals, refugee camps, schools, places of worship and government ministries. So looking ahead to the next decade and beyond, there is no question that we will continue to need engineering, ingenuity, innovation, creativity and collaboration to support sustainable development in Africa. And through our programmes and partnerships with friends and colleagues across the continent, we look forward to contributing towards that. I hope that after today, you will be as inspired as I am by the incredible work of our partners in Africa, the impact that they're already achieving and their potential to drive even greater impact in the future. And if that's the case, and you would like to support these programmes by introducing us to a person, an organisation, a foundation who might be able to provide a donation, we would be delighted to continue that conversation. And you can do that by scrolling down to the bottom of the event homepage where you can click on the Contact Us link. As a charity, these donations help to ensure that we can continue to deliver our goals of harnessing the power of engineering to create a sustainable society and inclusive economy that works for everyone. And our Africa programmes provide exemplars of how we can achieve that in practice and really importantly, of the mutual value of the international partnerships that you can see in action today. We are really proud to be part of this fantastic community of innovators and role models and change makers working across the engineering profession in sub-Saharan Africa. Please do take the time to get to know some of these extraordinary people better over the course of this showcase. Trust me, you will not be disappointed. So before I hand back to terri -Ann, all that remains is for me to wish you a very successful and enjoyable event. I hope that this will serve as a catalyst to further activate and nourish Africa-UK collaborations so that together we can continue to harness the power of engineering to deliver sustainable societies and inclusive economies. Thank you again for joining us today. Back to you, terri -Ann. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Salim. And before we hear from our next speaker, we have a poll to get you more engaged with today's showcase. Um, below the live stream screen, you'll find a poll uh, with questions that have just appeared on the right of the screen. If you have maximized your screen, please click the same icon and the poll will be just below. 
And we'd like to find out, you know, where are you joining us from this morning or this afternoon? Are you coming in from North Africa? Are you in Southern Africa? Are you in East Africa like I am here in Nairobi? Um, are you joining us from West Africa? Are you joining us from Central Africa? Or are you joining us from anywhere else in the world? We'd like you to let us know um, through that poll. I'll just uh, quickly get through that poll question again. We'd like to know where you're joining us from. Are you joining us from North Africa? Are you joining us from Southern Africa? East Africa, West Africa, Central Africa, or the rest of the world. Oh, wow. I see we've got South Africa, um, we've got London, West Africa, Glasgow. Cape Town, South Africa. We've got Leicester. Do we have nobody from Nairobi with me? <laughs> We've got Denmark. Egypt as well, North America, Ibadan. That's in West Africa. Oh, we've got Rwanda, someone else from East Africa as well. Oxford. Uh, Zakaria from Kenya, and thanks for sharing your name as well. Oh, wow. Thank you so much for letting us know where you are joining us from. And we are looking forward to a lot more um, interaction between all of us as we list, continue to listen. We will have some Q&A sessions as well but where you will be able to sh share um, either your questions or reactions or just your point of view on our, our conversation for today. Let's now hear from our first keynote speaker, Petra Matthews. Um, Petra is the Executive Director of Engineers Against Poverty and Cost, the Infrastructure Transparency Initiative. Petra was a forerunner in bringing together the engineering community in Africa and the UK in a consortium to identify engineering capacity, capacity needs in Sub-Saharan Africa. He's also a member of both the Academy's Higher Education Partnerships for Sub-Saharan Africa a Steering Committee and Africa Catalyst Steering Committee. Now remember, if you have questions for Petra, please add them um, into the Q&A box just below the live stream screen and we will select a few to ask him during the q a se um, session now over to you um Peter, to tell us more about the engineers for africa report i am honored to have the opportunity to speak to you this morning and to be part of this important event i have been invited to reflect on the engineers for africa report that was published 10 years ago by the Royal Academy of Engineering with support from Engineers Against Poverty. It is not very often that one has an opportunity to look back at a piece of work in detail and with the benefit of hindsight, and it has been an interesting exercise. The report received a lot of attention at the time, and it directly influenced the HEP SSA, Africa Catalyst, and Africa Prize programs. Given that these programs are at a transition point, it is particularly appropriate now to revisit this work. The way I have structured this contribution is to draw out from the report some examples of issues that were particularly pertinent and insightful and explain how they shaped the programs that I mentioned. I'll then briefly consider what it was about the report that made it so relevant. It is inevitable looking back how we proposed to tackle challenges 10 years ago that we do with the benefit of hindsight and with the knowledge of how effective our efforts were. I found as I reread the report that some challenges for the future became apparent to me. Therefore, after reflecting on the report itself and by way of conclusion, I will briefly outline what I consider three important challenges for the future of the Academy's programs. The first impression I had when rereading the report was to be reminded of the inadequacies of the process at the time. Insufficient resources, 
not enough data, not enough time, the kind of challenges that most researchers will be familiar with. However, that might have been the first, but it was not the overwhelming impression. Even after 10 years, the report is powerful. Whilst it does provide some new insight, its power derives mainly from the fact that it provides evidence of challenges that we already knew anecdotally, but were not rigorously tested, not considered in terms of their interaction or examined as part of a systemic problem. For example, and not surprisingly, the literature review and the individuals that we spoke to reinforced the widely held view that there were simply not enough engineers in most African countries. However, the research also revealed, somewhat counterintuitively, high levels of unemployment amongst engineering graduates. That struck us as interesting. If there are not enough engineers, why are so many engineering graduates unemployed? We needed to put these questions to employers and academics. The employers told us that too often, graduates lack the skills, knowledge and attitudes needed to make them employable. The academics told us that the curricula was outdated and there was not a process of routinely updating it to meet industrial requirements. Many of them also told us that as individuals, they lacked industrial and commercial exposure and rarely had the opportunities to develop their knowledge through continuing professional development or CPD. This was interesting and it led us to conclude that low engineering capacity in sub-Saharan Africa is more accurately described as an inadequate number of engineers with sufficient skills and experience rather than as an insufficient number of engineers per se. It might have been interesting to the research team, but it was not news to most of those that we were talking to. This was their day-to-day -day reality. They understood the shortcomings of higher education and the disconnect between academia and industry. But, but the problem was that their options for tackling these challenges were very limited. And this is where the academy came in. From the outset, the research was intended to inform a program aimed at addressing the underlying causes it identified. In this example, the HEP SSA program was eventually able to link universities with industrial partners. Academic staff undertook industrial attachments in which they are exposed to the latest technologies and industrial processes in a commercial setting. I was fortunate subsequently to meet some of the academic staff involved in these programs. In recalling their experiences, they became animated. They were learning, filling the gaps in their knowledge and experience that had constrained them as educators. And they were eager to share their plans for updating the curricula and refining their teaching methods. I encourage you to visit the online exhibition that forms part of this Africa Showcase event to see some examples. They were also frank about the limitations of their industrial placements. Many learned, for example, just how outdated the machinery and equipment was that the university had access to. It was beyond the scope of the program to replace that equipment, but there were examples of academic staff modifying it and acknowledging that where there was no alternative to using outdated equipment, at least they could make the case through the budgetary process to eventually replace it. And they could also help prepare students for what they would be faced with after graduating. The HEP SSA program also involved individuals from industry undertaking placements in universities. They gave lectures, supervised projects, and helped review the curricula. There were a number of examples of these placements resulting in joint ventures, sponsorships, and other types of collaboration, all stemming from the observations made in the Engineers for Africa report. A second example of an insight from the report that was to prove influential were the challenges affecting professional engineering institutions or PEIs. Almost without exception, the PEIs that we spoke to were under-resourced, undervalued, 
and the staff working within them poorly rewarded. And as a consequence, morale was often low and few in the wider environment thought of PEIs as important institutions in need of development. It also has to be said that the role of women within PEIs was often very limited with the exception of a few hugely impressive individuals who overcame the barriers to their participation. Contributing to the parlous state of many PEIs was the fact that few governments made it a requirement that engineers had to be professionally registered before being allowed to practice. This deprived PEIs of income, which in turn made it more difficult then to support existing and attract new members. It was interesting to see the responses of engineers when questioned about career satisfaction. The two things identified that would most improve career satisfaction, they informed us, were more and better access to CPD opportunities and involvement in engineering networks, both important functions of PEIs. The Africa Catalyst program sought to address these challenges. The type of activities supported, including strengthening the offer of PEIs to young members, improving gender and diversity, increasing income streams, and improving communications and outreach. There are many examples of impact in the online exhibition, and importantly, lots of resources on the Academy's website that are aimed at sharing the lessons from this experience. A third example of the report informing the Academy's Africa programs is the creation of the Africa Prize for Engineering Innovation in 2014. The report identified challenges in terms of brain drain, unemployment, and the impact of poor economic growth on the achievement of national development goals. Looking at the landscape today, it is very apparent that supporting people on the continent to become job creators as well as job takers is a sensible idea, particularly when considering the youth dividend that is becoming increasingly pronounced. However, at the time, there was little evidence of practical support being provided for it. The Academy launched the Africa Prize to stimulate, celebrate and reward innovation and entrepreneurship on the continent. It provides training, mentoring and communication support to individuals that are driving some of the most exciting and important challenges on the continent. The diverse topics covered include health, retail, women's hygiene, energy, environmental protection and many more. The Africa Prize alumni have created jobs, developed enterprises, and improved countless lives. Go to the online exhibition to see their stories, and I guarantee that you will be inspired. The Engineers for Afri Africa report, as I mentioned previously, produced with modest resources, continues to inform the Academy's Africa programs. Over the course of the last 10 years, we have generated new knowledge, adjusted our priorities and adopted new approaches, but the analysis and conclusions in the report remain relevant. With the benefit of hindsight, it is an effective example of using research evidence to inform policy, program design and practice. I've been thinking about the reasons why the report proved to be so relevant and four came to mind. First, we were always committed to listening to our African partners. To a significant extent, the challenge was one of giving voice to them and learning from their experiences. Second, we are focused on problem solving and developing practical solutions. Look at the outputs of the programs and you will see an emphasis on what is pragmatic and achievable in what are often very challenging circumstances. Third, we have been at pains to promote learning between partners. It would be wrong to assume that lessons from one country or institution can easily be transferred to others, but we have found that bringing people together to share their experiences enables them to absorb what is useful and translate the lessons from one setting to another. And finally, we have been very fortunate in the quality of partners that we have had. 
I was involved in some of the early exploratory discussions with partners, particularly in Tanzania, Kenya, and Zimbabwe. And it quickly became apparent who the individuals and institutions were that had the creativity and commitment to make a success of the programs. We are fortunate they have remained on this journey with us. I want to come now to the three challenges that I mentioned in my opening remarks. The first and perhaps the most obvious is sustainability of the programs. The importance of this should not be underestimated, but neither should the difficulty of achieving it. We are often talking about institutions that are chronically underfunded and whose staff routinely face difficult choices about what can and can't be funded. We don't doubt the determination of our partners to achieve sustainability of the activities that we have supported, and there are positive signs. But realistically, this will may remain a challenge for all of us involved for some time. The second is giving African partners more say in the decision making of the programs. There is a strong trend in international development towards locally led development and a shift in power from the global north, where grant funding tends to originate, to the global south, where their support is needed. We have been alert to this need and have made important improvements, including involving African partners in the governance of the programmes. But this is not the time to rest on our laurels. It is the time to go further and faster. And thirdly, we need to do more to convince decision makers in governments and international agencies of the importance of strengthening the engineering profession and the institutions that it relies on in sub-Saharan Africa. It is inconceivable to think that here in the UK, for example, we could dispense with the Engineering Council, Engineering UK, the professional engineering institutions, or the Royal Academy of Engineering. They are needed to regulate the profession, to maintain standards, promote excellence and inform government. Why would anyone imagine that African countries do not have the need for similar institutions that are attuned to their own conditions and priorities? The Academies Africa programmes have helped identify the needs and demonstrate practical solutions, but others must also adopt this agenda if we are to address the scale of the need. In closing, allow me to briefly mention the other contributors to the Engineers for Africa report. They were my then colleagues at Engineers Against Poverty, Jill Wells and Lily Ryan Collins, and from the Academy, Holly Wright and Hayatun Silem, who of course you heard from previously. Hayatun was the driving force behind the Africa programs in the early years, and now as chief executive, helps to ensure that they retain a central importance in the Academy's activities. The Engineers for Africa report threw down a challenge 10 years ago. All those who responded to that challenge through their involvement in the programs that it helped to inform should be proud of what has been achieved but they should also remain restless and impatient because so much more needs to be done. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Peter. Um, that was quite insightful and we really liked how you distilled those three challenges, um, you know, sustainability of the programs, the decision making around them, and of course, um, collaboration between government and international ag um, agencies. And you also asked a pertinent question, you know, if there's so many engineers in Africa, why are so many of them um, unemployed? And I'd like to pose the same question to our audience. What way forward as we think of Africa's engineers in the next decade? And we will sample your responses later in the Q&A. Let's now hear from Professor Funmi Oloni Sakin, she's the Vice President and Vice Principal International and Professor of Security, Leadership and Development at King's College London. Uh, Professor Funmi's work is centered on bridging the academia and the world of policy and practice. 
She founded the Africa Leadership Center, that's ALC based in London and Nairobi, to inform and influence policy in Africa and globally. Again, if you do have any questions for Professor Funmi, please add them into the Q&A box below the live stream screen, and we will select a few to ask her during the Q&A um, session. Let's now hear from Professor Funmi. Over to you, Prof. Thank you so very much. Uh, let me first uh, begin by thanking you, uh, our distinguished host, uh, Terry Achebet. Thank you so much. Uh, let me also uh, acknowledge uh, and thank uh, Dr. Hayatun uh, Silem, who is the Chief Executive of the Royal Academy of Engineering, uh, and of course, uh, Peter Matthews, Executive Director of Engineers Against Poverty, uh, and our distinguished guests, colleagues, and friends of Africa, wherever you are in the world, warm greetings uh, to you. The topic uh, of today's event invokes several metaphors uh, in my mind. And so please permit me to draw inspiration from this uh, in framing my remarks uh, today. I, I want to start uh, by offering a foundational question. Uh, and of course, several other questions will derive uh, from this. And that question is, for whom is Africa engineering the future? For whom, for whom are we uh, engineering the future? Related to that, therefore, what is the vision of that future? How will uh, education, and in particular higher education institutions, uh, both in the UK and in Africa, rise to the challenge that underpins that vision? Lastly, what will this mean for institutions such as the Royal Academy of Engineering and King's College London that have been more deliberate, more intentional, I would say, about contributing to Africa's future? In the case of the Academy, the report that Peter was just talking about, Engineers for Africa, uh, which was launched 10 years ago and which, you know, helps us chart some progress today, tells a vitally important story and speaks to the structural roots uh, some of the structural roots of the challenge uh, of education and development, or if you like, under development in many areas uh, in Africa. But now let me uh, provide some context, right? uh, because Africa is really what we're showcasing here uh, and the role of engineering in all of that. I think we all know uh, that Africa is the youngest continent by far. It has an average age of 19.5 years. It is the fastest growing continent. It has that rising youth bulge, which is why it has this average age, which is projected to grow until 2050, when it will have at least three of the most populous countries in the world. And signposting that, of course, Nigeria, which will be the fourth largest, uh, rapidly on that list you'd have, you have Uganda and Tanzania. But of course, if you look at the population of uh, Ethiopia, the DRC today, uh, Kenya, all of those who would double the population of Africa have already been born. And I think that's the reality that confronts us. And that's the population dividend that uh, Peter was referring to a short while ago. Uh, and therefore, when you look at the continent of Africa, it's perhaps and unfortunately best known for its insecurities, which is ex exemplified, if you like, by armed conflict and poverty. But its immense natural resource on, uh, endowment is unrivaled. And this is why Africa will stand apart from many continents in the time to come. Those natural resources are untapped or mistapped and not planned for by those countries. Look at West Africa alone, boasts of bauxite, uh, if you like, cobalt, columbite, copper, diamond, gold, iron ore, lead, limestone, manganese, natural gas, petroleum, petroleum oil, phosphate, rutile, salt, tin, uranium, and zinc. This is not my work. It's the work of Abiodo Alao, a tragedy of endowment. And it spells out the available natural resources on the continent of Africa. The big story around it is it's extracted, raw materials are ex extracted, processed outside of Africa, and then sold back to Africa at twice, thrice, four times, 10 times the uh, amount that they were bought for. This is the real tragedy of endowment in Africa. So in essence, the rest of the world takes, tends to take out of Africa more than they put in. 
And as a matter of fact, we know that diaspora remittances uh, from the likes of uh, myself, Shebet, different Africans in different parts of the world, dwarfs foreign aid uh, seven times. I'm going somewhere with, with the points I'm making. Of the 20 of the 20 fastest growing economies in Africa, half of them are post-war economies. Why are they so fast growing? Uh, all right, more than half, I would even say. So once you take uh, when once you take out the Botswana, Seychelles, and so on, you be you're left with more than half of those 20 fastest growing at a, at at least six percent per year. Notwithstanding COVID, what's projected for next year still shows that they will be some of the fastest growing. Uh, but what accounts for this is the extraction of raw materials and, of course, the injection of development support, as well as those type diaspora remittances that I talk about. And when you therefore look at the place of education in Africa, it mirrors some of the stuff that Peter was talking about now. One in 10 uh, international students, when you look at the rest of the world, is African. All right. So, of course, this is a potential channel for draining talent from Africa. Uh, but while this tide really can't be stopped because young people, people everywhere will invariably make choices about the forms of education they want and the, loca the location and preferred location of education, replenishing of talent base becomes very important. All right. But where are we with university enrollment? If you want to think of the replenishing of that talent base, that's what offers the potential for replenishment. And yet, here's what we know uh, from available evidence. Less than 10% of sub-Saharan African youth are enrolled in post-secondary education. I think Peter's work uh, and the Royal Academy's work focus on uh, engineering related, but they are all connected in particular ways. In Nigeria, for example, fewer than 40% of the university applicants uh, are regularly admitted to Nigerian universities. So that leaves an estimated 1 million Nigerian uni uh, uh, people, young people, without any university placement every year. And those, those are those who qualify uh, to go to university. When you compare with India, um, which of course, like much of Africa, is also still experiencing a youth bulge, it has more than 600 million people under the age of 25, but India has a much improved enrollment rate of 27%. Africa has less than 10%, I said, and Brazil has nearly 20%, with Indonesia at 17%, all compared with an average of 44% for OECD countries and 38% in the G20 countries. I wanted to place all of this in context if we're talking about uh, how Africa will engineer the future. The challenges with education content, content itself, which uh, Peter referenced, not least in engineering, are already well reflected in that report uh, that, uh, that Peter presented. So, so the argument I want to make uh, to take us forward uh, in this discussion, for example, is that if we reflect on the questions that I had outlined earlier, there are several interrelated arguments. Higher education and, if you like, higher education institutions, universities specifically, and their partners, need to form a new social contract with African societies, and I'm careful in talking about African societies uh, in particular, to help them succeed. That is the role of a university in society. But in this context, it requires a reinvention of education, and I dare say a new paradigm in partnership between university, industry, and government to transform the African condition some of which I alluded to earlier, and to increase Africa's own contribution to the world uh, in even more positive ways. And therefore, this in turn reinforces the social contract that we as UK uh, universities and institutions have with our diverse communities, which include a global community consisting uh, of African diaspora and so many other diversity, uh, diversities of people. And here's why I make this kind of argument. Uh, some of the earlier speakers, uh, the earlier speakers I alluded to this, like most problems that have complexity at its core, Africa's problems present themselves in interdisciplinary, uh, uh, in the interdisciplinary ways, and the next generation's vision and approach to problem solving will shape the responses of Africa, the responses to Africa's problems. Engineering has a crucial interdisciplinary role 
at the core of this. So those engineers who will invent the future, or uh, I dare say reinvent it, we're talking about the future, they will of necessity be a new breed. They'll be different from before because now, today, looking through the eyes of the next generation, not least through their experience and actions today, one can envision the challenges of their time for which they need to act de decisively. That ne next generation, therefore, for engineering purposes, and I'm, I know I'm speaking to the experts in this room, I'm not one, but I work with a lot uh, of them within King's, the intensity and speed of communication and transnational engagement requires new skills. That's a, in the character of young Africans and young people globally, uh, in, uh, really. Collective and distributed leadership with team working and multi-layered engagement. This I understand, even from some of our own colleagues um, uh, at King's and in other places, this is the essence of engineering. Global in outlook, we already know that. Champions for social justice and a keen interest in environment with new forms of sustainability. And this has implications for research and innovation. At the core of this, of the engagement with Africa, this has to be placed. Technical expertise, therefore, uh, is of great importance to next generation leaders. They will create future proof products and services. The African youth is not, the African youth is not an exception. Uh, when you compare them to the rest of the world, but they desperately lack access to world-class education that hinders, uh, and this hinders the process. So, so what am I saying in short? I want to make two more uh, arguments before I make my, my closing remarks. The first is that we need to turn engineering for development to engineering in development. Um, the study, a study at King's uh, supported by uh, EPSRC uh, uh, with African Leadership Center and a couple of our colleagues uh, in, in engineering already revealed that when we create from a distance and do not actually immerse ourselves in those settings, there are challenges. And we've seen some of the ex examples uh, shown in the report, um, this 10 year report we're talking about. So therefore, in thinking about engineering and development. This will be key, not just for development. This will be key to reversing some of the current trends in African development, brain drain, engineers live in Africa. Uh, and we've seen that in the case of South Africa, and this is on the top of the agenda to be addressed. And education in engineering uh, needs to be relevant to the larger ecosystem in Africa. Achieving this requires a new approach to education delivery and a new approach to partnership with the intentionality in bringing professional, uh, if you like, the professional community and industry partnerships to bear in the education journey. So as I draw this to a close, I think we need to see a new beginning. We need to be asking questions about the next 10 years. Uh, I see King's uh, King's College London and the Royal Academy of Engineering uh, having, uh, they've had different trajectories for engaging Africa, but there's a massive potential for us to come closer together to leverage our existing alliances, to multiply the impact of our work, to shape a new kind of future that helps strengthen the social contract between African universities and their societies, and by extension, our institutions and our society uh, here in the UK. And how do I propose uh, we do this as, uh, as, as I close. I think, first and foremost, we need to make world-class education available in virtual and blended forms to African students, providing them with a choice of staying on the continent, and to deliver this at scale, building pipelines from not just the undergraduate, but especially from master's to PhD, in order to build a solid research and innovation base for society. Uh, we need to take an approach of a split campus doctoral academy through joint PhDs and other arrangements. And the Royal Academy of Engineering is already uh, engaged in these kinds of partnerships. I'm talking about scaling up in a way that we can educate cohorts uh, and mass and mass all of our own efforts at particular challenges in African societies. And therefore, building interdisciplinary problem solving programs with 21st century engineering in development at the core with degree pathways connecting students to industry and connecting them to the larger ecosystem in their society uh, is what we're committed to at King's. And I think this tells a similar story with the Royal Academy of 
uh, engineering. I, I want to return uh, and therefore est establishing, uh, if you like, a community of practice among engineering academics across our network of peers that will catalyze and sustain uh, this approach is what I see as a way to the future. Enlighten self-interest for us at King's, growing doctoral students while fulfilling our mission of an international community that serves the world. But it's also a leadership question. And I want to close with a question, if I return to the question that I posed at the start. For whom is Africa engineering the future? I want to, I dare say, that Africa is engineering this future, if you like, for Africa's next generation in its own image, imagination, and vision of the future, for an interdisciplinary and transnational next generation of leaders in Africa and the world, for an intergenerational renewal of Africa and an enabled, empowered contribution to the world. And this means that developing cohorts of next generation of African engineers will be critical they need to be actively engaged in not only renews, in renewing Africa's economy, but in providing interdisciplinary leadership and engagement. I look forward uh, to working with the Royal Academy, as well as many of our colleagues across the African continent, with whom we already partner, uh, but, but certainly to take all of this to the next level. Thank you so very much. Thank you, uh, Alain, there. Thank you very much, um, Professor Funri. Thank you for nudging us to think forward and to think of solutions for the next decade. And you asked us, for whom is Africa engineering the future? And I'd like to pose the same question to our audience. For whom is Africa engineering the future? Prof has also called for a new paradigm in partnership um, between university, academia, and industry. Yes. And I'd like to ask you, what would this paradigm look like in I your view? You. Please share with us this in your um, in the Q&A. Um, Professor Fumi, we'd like to just start our Q&A with you now. How do universities foster knowledge communities to drive science, technology, and engineering innovation um, across the African continent? Sorry, could you please repeat that? Uh, I'm so sorry, Terian, please repeat that. How do universities foster knowledge communities to drive science, technology, and engineering innovation um, across the African continent? I, I mean, I, I think that's that's a fantastic question. And I, in a sense, I was trying to allude to that, that number one, we have to take societal problem solving as a common entry point. So engineers are already in that mode. But in order to really innovate for relevance across society, I see us, I see collective leadership uh, between the academy, uh, in this case, I, I mean academic, uh, the academic community, the Royal Academy being part of this and hybrid in, in a sense. So between the university, industry, government, and naturally, logically, the natural society on the African continent, that natural society is this space where young people continue to innovate. When you see the tech hubs uh, across the continent of Africa, you're in Nairobi yourself and you see what we have in Nairobi. Uh, to what extent do governments tap into this? To what extent do we actually see the kind of innovative curriculum that helps us really uh, ignite and actually, if you like, multiply the impact of the innovation we see on the streets of the continent? You can look at Nairobi, Lagos, Johannesburg, you can look across the board, and this innovation actually is what has kept African societies uh, moving. It's not, and I, as an academic, I think I can pronounce myself of that, in spite of the governments, they have continued to do. But I see a collective massing of effort that brings us, integrates all of this in a way that our curriculum becomes dynamic, and that actually we deliver what we do in curriculum, in the delivery and in the application, we do it at once. And you actually see a pathway between the university and the community in a way that is different. Uh, this is massive partnership that is required. The methodology is what is the new paradigm as far as I'm concerned. Thank you, um, thank you Prof. What are, what are one or two things you'd like to see for African academia in the next decade? I think uh, Africa, academia in the next decade, 
has to start uh, moving away from uh, traditional curriculum, has to put research from first degree, by the way, uh, a new way of, you know, of researching the self and the community and society, building that into first degree uh, curriculum. You can say you can do it easily in engineering, but across the board, uh, I think we need to make that, we need to take the larger ecosystem uh, in, the, uh, in the African continent into consideration in curriculum design, and therefore, you know, knowledge building inside that curriculum so that they're not two separate things uh, is one of the things. Collective working, joint degree um, within Africa, joint degrees within Africa so that people move seamlessly across borders. I'd like to see that. I'd also like to see cohort building around particular problems across universities, but, you know, but across university and government and industry. So far, it's been too separate. Some of the stuff that came out of the report, which I was so pleased to uh, to see and read, is so relevant. But actually, we need to upscale what to uh, make, you know, and, and do that across the board. We are not, you know, I think there's so much more that can be that can be done. The face of Africa, um, uh, of academia in Africa, needs to be different if we're going to really solve those uh, societal problems I will talk about. Well, thank you so much, uh, Professor Funmi. Thank you for making time to be with us this morning and to just and for opening our eyes to what the possibilities are and to you know getting us to really rethink what the face of the African education system um, is like. Thank you so much. Let's now bring um, Peter Matthews back into the conversation. Um, Peter, it was here to great to hear that deep dive into the Engineers for Africa report. Uh, my apologies as our electricity just went off, but our generator should kick in shortly, so the lights will be back. Um, um, Peter, it was great to hear that deep dive into the Engineers for Africa report. And we do have a couple of questions for you that's pulled from, um, from our audience. And I'll just quickly start off, you know, you mentioned PIEs um, in your presentation. Just Let's delve into that a little bit more. What is a professional engineering institution and why are they important? Terry Ann, forgive me, I'm having technical difficulties and I've only just rejoined. Was that question addressed to me? Yes, yes, it was. Don't worry, we're having technical issues on my <laughs> side as well. Well, I, I do apologize. <laughs> um, let, let, let me address your question and apologies for the technical difficulties from my side. Yeah, professional engineering institutions are, are, are extremely important. Um, they are membership organizations. The kind of support that they give to their members is guidance with professional development. They run events, seminars, conferences, journals, other technical publications, access to a library uh, very often. And these are the kind of things that when we uh, did the research, when we were talking to engineers, these are the things that they needed to improve their career satisfaction. So they're really important in terms of connecting engineers, um, informing them, updating their professional development. The other important role that professional engineering institutions often play um, is where there is a requirement for individual engineers to be professionally registered before they can practice. Now, that's certainly the case here in the UK. In many African countries, particularly 10 years ago, when we were looking at the situation there, that wasn't the case. And we found that that was making life for PEIs uh, very difficult because they weren't getting the number of members that they wanted. They weren't bringing in the fees and they weren't able to provide support to the professional engineers that they required. So very important inst institutions, terri -Ann. Thank you so much. And I realize I, I did say professional uh, PIEs and not PEIs um, as, 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 as they're supposed to be. Um, tell us, how do academy programs like the GCRF, um, Africa Catalyst Program, for example, ensure that they remain inclusive and representatives, uh, representative of the needs of sub-Saharan African partners? Well, that's a good question, Terry Ann, and it, it, it's a very important challenge. And I alluded to this in my in my previous intervention around when when I identified the challenges. 
and finding ways to give African partners uh, a greater say in the program. Um, because I also outlined that when, when, when we started the work, the program began with a process of listening to African partners, trust building, responding to their needs rather than assuming that we knew what the solution was and it was about us uh, imposing or bringing that solution. So we use the term partnership that implies a level of equity and mutual accountability. But in many cases, the way the international development is done, resources flow down and accountability flows up. So that isn't really a genuine partnership. Genuine partnerships have to be trust based. Um, they need to be equitable. Um, and there are things that can be done to improve that. Now, certainly there has been development over the last 10 years. There is a much greater role now for individuals from amongst our African partners in the governance of the programs. For example, uh, participating in the steering committees uh, that oversee those programs. So real progress has been made. But I think that we can go further and that will help kind of strengthen these links, uh, these links uh, and make sure that the programs remain relevant. This is a trend that's evident in international development around locally led, locally based development. And it's a shift in the relations from the global north, where resources tend to emanate, to the global south, where that uh, the need for those resources and the programs is are required. So the kind of things that we can look at are increased representation on steering committees, um, in region advisory boards, but more participatory monitoring, evaluation and learning practices to make sure that it's two way, um, but also uh, mutual due diligence and transparency. So that when, um, when, when a grant making organization, in this case, the Academy, when it's doing the due diligence on potential partners, uh, we also need to be open in terms of our systems and our procedures so that potential partners are also to make uh, an assessment um, towards us as the grant maker as well. Um, it's important to acknowledge that the Academy mediates the relationship between funders and the grant recipients and funders often impose constraints on the relationship between the grant making body uh, and the partner. Um, so a lot of it, I think, is about educating funders as well. Some of the challenges that we have is that program design must not be based. It, it should be based on the user needs rather than the funding criteria. So it's really important that grant makers and the funders are responsive to the needs of potential partners. They're always time bound. bound. Um, the world in international development doesn't move in project cycles. Um, so constraints on timing of programs, being patient to partners of when it's realistic to complete tasks uh, is important. And simpler funding proposals so that those who need help the most aren't excluded. And that's certainly something that we've done in the steering committees um, that I've been involved in. It's important that um, those partners who are not used to filling out grant forms and building those relationships are not excluded. So a lot that can be done, Terry, and I think to give more uh, decision making power to African partners and that would strengthen the programs and make sure that they remain relevant. Um, Peter, I'd like to ask you a question that I um, fronted to Professor Funmi earlier. What are one or two things that you'd like to see in the next decade for engineers in Africa? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, the first one practically, uh, I mean, Africa, engineers in particular, uh, sustainable sources of finance, um, even where, and th there are really good, talented individuals and against all the odds, very strong professional engineering institutions, but without the investment um, in infrastructure, in industrial development, uh, it's really difficult to make progress. So sustainable sources of finance, the emphasis at the moment amongst international agencies, the multilateral development banks and the G20 is around mobilizing private investment to fill what sometimes is called uh, the, the infrastructure investment gap. 
and mobilizing more private finance is really important. But currently, African countries rely predominantly on public investment from their own governments. So it's also really important to uh, to work with governments, improve the capacity, uh, improve uh, expertise around project planning, for example, so that we get the maximum value from public investment. So sustainable sources of finance is a really important one, both strengthening private and public investment. Um, the, the, the other one, I think, um, it's, it's, it, it's really important that we give recognition to engineers, to, to the importance of the profession, to the role of uh, a professional engineering institution. Um, I sometimes worry that there's, we kind of neglect, or in African countries, there's a neglect of the profession, a failure to invest in the institutions and recognize their uh, importance. So recognition of individual engineers, support and investment in higher education, continuing professional development, recognition of the essential role of professional engineering institutions. I think the Academy through its programs have really identified the importance of those institutions, things that can be done practically uh, to improve them, um, but we need other partners, we need governments and other international agencies uh, to pick up on this agenda that the Academy has been so good in establishing over the last 10 years. Thank you, Peter. I'd like to ask a final question to both you and uh, Professor Funmin. I'll start off with you. Um, why are Africa-UK partnerships important for sustainable development? Yeah, that's that. That's a very good question. Let me maybe t two or three things that, that I would answer to that. Um, the global challenges that we face, be it the climate emergency, uh, pandemics, reducing conflict and building peace, require multilateral cooperation. Uh, as as uh, it's one of the uh, the important things that's come out of the recognition of globalization is the extent to which we need multi multilateral cooperation, a global response to divert, to uh, tackling global challenges. So that's really important. The second one I would say is that the historical relationship between the UK and Africa uh, has contributed to its underdevelopment. Now, slavery and colonialism are not the only contributing factors, but it's important to recognize that they are contributing factors, and that imposes a moral obligation on us I believe, to, to, to support Africa. Not everyone will be persuaded by that, but there's also the third one, a very strong argument uh, around self-interest. Africa has extraordinary human uh, and natural resources and mutually beneficial trade and investment between Britain, the other parts of the developed world and Africa uh, can produce huge benefits for Africa, but huge benefits uh, for the rest of the world too being able to tap into the expertise that there is uh, amongst people in Africa. Professor Funmi, um, your response to the same, why are Africa-UK partnerships important for sustainable development? And I know that in your presentation, you did talk a lot about partnerships and the role of you know, new partnerships as well as changing, just you know, having that paradigm shift in terms of how we as an African continent are looking at partnerships. Uh, absolutely. I, I think uh, Peter already alluded to some of this. There's mutuality uh, in this. The pattern of partnership has just uh, tended to benefit one side, uh, you know, over the other. And I think I alluded to this in terms of natural resource extraction, for, uh, uh, for example. But going forward, it's as stark as this. If the UK uh, and UK institutions fail to find equitable partnerships with Africa, whether it's higher education institutions or government or industry, uh, and Africa continues to remain in a state of underdevelopment, notwithstanding its potential, the blowback will be against the UK. So far, we see that blowback. It, some of it is exaggerated because really Africa cannot be seen as a ground uh, for uh, breeding terrorism in the UK, no. But the migration question 
is being, you know, is being dealt with in an inequitable way. When it suits us in the UK, we see African migration as very negative for the UK. We try to keep, we're trying to keep young people, uh, you know, or as many people as possible, not just young people, away from the UK. <laughs> but when it is also, it also suits us, we bring them back in. Look at what's happening with healthcare workers that we're trying to bring uh, from different parts of the world, including Africa at the moment. And we, and in fact, it's gotten to a place where some African governments, including Nigeria, are saying, help us keep our young people at home because of this brain drain question. What, an, what equitable partnership therefore looks like is that we make the best choices. We enable Africans and British people to make the best choices for their development by giving equality of opportunity, equality of access to world-class education, to economic uh, growth, to human development. And I think we will reap the benefits mutually. So there are mutual needs. Sometimes those needs are not always aligned, but the potential to have mutual benefits actually makes the UK greater in the end if it invests in a timely way and in an equitable way. If Africa is developed, given the historical ties, some of them negative, as Peter talked about, uh, a developed Africa that UK contributes to is going to be the, to the benefit of the UK uh, ultimately. Of course, the benefits to Africa, you know, can't be, uh, I can't even say that uh, enough. And that's what I'll say is the equitable nature of those benefits, of that partnership that we need to pursue in the future. Thank you. I think we don't hear you, Terry-Ann. You're on mute, I think. Oh, there you go. Uh, my apologies for that. Professor Funmi and Peter Matthews, thank you so much for sharing your insights. This has set the context perfectly for our next session and, of course, the rest of the conversations we're going to have um, for the rest of the day. So thank you so, so much. To our online audience, just a reminder, don't forget to share this event on your socials. Remember, the hashtag we're using is Africa Showcase. And remember to tag Reng Global um, in your tweets or your other socials as you continue to share. Now, before we launch into a comfort break shortly, um, we have our second audience poll. And I hope you have been paying attention because this poll comes from um, a presentation that had been done earlier by Dr. Salim. And I will ask what percentage of engineers in Sub-Saharan Africa are women? Below the live stream screen, you'll find that the poll questions have um, appeared. That will be on the right of the screen. If you have maximized the screen, click the same icon and the poll will be just below. So the question is, what percentage of engineers in sub-Saharan Africa are women? A, is it less than 5%? B, is it less than 10%? C, less than 17%? Or D, less than 26%. I'll give you another clue. The answer is in the exhibition. Do explore the exhibition during your break and I'll let you know the answer right after we return. Please leave the live stream open and we will restart promptly at 11 a.m. GMT.
Hello and welcome back. I hope you're feeling even more energized after your cup of tea or coffee. And if you have had tea or coffee, I hope it's Kenyan tea because we've got the best. If you're just joining us, I am Terry Anchevet and I'm your moderator for the day. Let's begin by sharing the results of the poll I asked just before the comfort break. Um, and if any of you have not added your answer yet, I'll give a moment or two um, for you to respond. And the question we asked is, what percentage of engineers in sub-Saharan Africa are women? We asked, is it A, less than 5%? Is it B, less than 10%? Is it C, less than 70%? Or D, less than 26%? And as I said, I gave you two clues. The first one was that the answer was in our uh, first um, presentation by Dr. Salim. And the answer is also in the exhibition. I hope you've had a moment to have a look. Let's wait to see the results now. <clears throat> All right. Um, well, I see that most of you are actually paying attention. The answer is B, less than 10% of engineers in sub-Saharan Africa are women. All right, so next up, we're going to have a quick introductory chat with three fantastic awardees from the Academy's Africa programs. These are all change makers who have been making enormous strides to improve societal outcomes and address global grand challenges through engineering. All our three speakers have been funded through the Academy's um, Africa programs, either as a business, an innovator, academic institution, or a not-for-profit organization. I'll ask each of our speakers to briefly introduce who they are, where they are based, and what their connection is to the Academy. Aditi, let's start with you. Great, thanks, Terry, and hi, everyone. I am Aditi Lachman uh, from Women. We're a global organization working on gender diversity, equity, and inclusion. Uh, we are based in Johannesburg, South Africa, and we were part of the Africa Catalyst program. Thank you, Aditi. Let's now head over to Professor Musa. Professor? Thanks a lot, Terry Ann. So, I'm Abiodun Musa Haibino. I'm the principal investigator for artificial intelligence for clean energy under the EPSA program. And we are based at the Federal University of Technology, Mino, Nigeria. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Musa. And last but not least, Beth Koigi. Over to you, Beth. Hi, uh, this is Beth Koigi. I'm the founder of Magic Water, a Kenyan company that specializes in air to water technology, especially to provide communities in arid or semi-arid regions with a decentralized and an alternative water source. Um, um, I participated in 2019 Africa Prize and I was one of the shortlists. Well, thank you so much, um, Beth, Professor Musa Aditi, for making such a big difference in the different spaces that you're working with. And I'm excited that we have Africa represented, um, you know, in this uh, particular panel. We have Aditi, who's joining us from Southern Africa, uh, Professor Musa from West Africa, and of course, Beth, who's joining me from a very cold and gray Nairobi. All right, now each of our speakers will give us a brief deep dive into how they or their projects have been supported by the Academy, and then we'll come back uh, together for a panel discussion. And if you do have any questions um, as you listen, please add them into the Q&A below, <clears throat> Q&A box, which is below the live stream screen. And I can see that we have so many questions. We'll be able to um, respond to some of the ones that you had asked earlier as well. Hi, I am Aditi Lachman from Women. Our Africa Catalyst project is capacity building for women in engineering bodies in sub-Saharan Africa. 
It is estimated that women make up less than 10% of engineers in sub-Saharan Africa. Engineering is a key driver for sustainable development, yet the continent's full workforce potential is not being utilized. At Womanj, we believe that investing in women all along the engineering pipeline is essential to solving the world's greatest challenges. Through the Africa Catalyst program, our aim was to strengthen the capacity of women in engineering bodies to promote gender diversity and inclusion in engineering in sub-Saharan Africa, leveraging Womanj's skills and experience in developing and running women in engineering programs across 24 countries. Funding and global media exposure from the Royal Academy of Engineering supported women to amplify impact for local women in engineering bodies across the continent by thinking global and acting local. Over two phases of the project, namely capacity building for women in engineering bodies in sub-Saharan Africa and capacity building for women in engineering bodies in West Africa, we worked across seven countries with various women in engineering bodies. Key activities we were able to accomplish included strengthening and building the institutional capacity of relevant stakeholders, increasing knowledge uh, among engineering bodies about effective practices for improving gender diversity and inclusion in engineering, creating resiliency in advocacy approaches in a digital future, and supporting institutions to showcase the work women in engineering were doing in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Three key achievements we were able to attain through this program included providing leadership development and capacity building resources, building engineering pipelines for girls and women, amplifying voices through digital advocacy. Women focused firstly on strengthening the institutional capacity of relevant stakeholders through leadership development and training on implementing high impact outreach initiatives. Ensuring the institutions were provided with a pipeline of female talent looking to join the industry. Women coordinated a series of outreach programs for high school girls and tertiary level engineering students designed to educate future talent about thriving in the industry. In 2020, as a response to the COVID-19 pandemic and the commitment to deliver impact, Women redesigned a capacity building for women in engineering bodies in West Africa from an in-person intervention to a fully virtual rollout and placed a strong focus on the importance of digital advocacy to ensure women's voices were heard online. Our impact in numbers under Africa Catalyst includes conducting work in seven countries, training more than 125 women in engineering bodies with capacity building skills, conducting outreach programs to, uh, to more than 1,900 high school and university students, and enabling women in engineering bodies to produce digital content with more than 20,000 online engagements. By empowering women engineers on the ground, we can now develop the next generation of female engineers, transform the sector, and help build a society that is resilient to future crises. Beyond Africa Catalyst, we are committed to continuing the impact with our partners by creating a more connected engineering community, amplifying One Million Girls in STEM, a global awareness campaign initiated by women with the aim to reach one million girls through STEM education and awareness initiatives by 2027, and raising the profile of women in engineering on the continent through our social media platforms and global community. Our mission in underlining, underlining the need to drive global advocacy and support for a diverse and inclusive engineering industry is important now more than ever before. Thank you to the Royal Academy of Engineering for being on this journey with us.
Hi, this is Beth Koiki, uh, the CEO and co-founder of Magic Water, a Kenyan company that specializes in air to water systems and especially to provide drinking water in arid and semi-arid regions throughout Africa. The UN estimate that by 2025, 1.8 billion people will be living in water scarce regions. And this is just not just in Sub-Saharan Africa, but this is worldwide. In Kenya alone, 56% of people do not have regular access to drinking water. So meaning their regular water source goes off even up to six months. So people have to look for alternative ways of getting drinking water, either from buying from vendors who sell the water very expensively, or you know, other informal source of drinking water, which is actually highly contaminated. What Magic is doing, we're introducing a decentralized water source, and that is air to water system. There's six times more water in the atmosphere than there is in all rivers around the world, meaning we are tapping into one of the biggest water resources in the world. In 2019, Magic Water participated in African Prize, and even though we were not, you know, one of the winners for the award, we got a lot of things from this program. First, we had our first client, that is Microsoft during this period, and we got access to a wide range of expertise. And some of the experts that we got access to are lawyers who helped us in drafting these contracts. And also we got um, advices from, um, from the accountant on taxations in South Africa. So remember, we are a Kenyan company. Our first client was based in South Africa, a place where, or a country where we've never been in before but we were able to implement this project because we had assistance uh, from Africa Prize. The key achievements from this program include, we pivoted our business model. That is, uh, we, just, we moved from just depending on NGOs as our only client to actually now looking at households and other um, clients such as corporates, people in agriculture, and also, you know, in restaurants, off the grid restaurants, um, and many other clients that we had not seen before. We also received a lot of publicity from this program, um, and we got coverage from um, media houses such as CNN and BBC. Uh, but, you know, the biggest or the highlight of the publicity we got is we featured in a documentary, Netflix documentary, which was basically uh, looking at you know, available solutions to water challenges. And this documentary went across all over the world. Um, and we are very honored to be part of this documentary, which actually brought a lot of plans to Magic Water and a lot of traffic to our website. And not to mention things like, um, we also got a lot of assistance in redoing our website, in our, basically our, um, our marketing and, you know, our publications. Uh, so we got a lot of assistance and a lot of do over in what we were doing. Currently, we have 20 plus devices in the market, meaning we are generating over 300,000 liters of water per month. And this has benefited over 500 households. That, that is just, you know, not just in Kenya, but we have done installations in South Africa. We have done installation in India, and actually we have sent out devices to UK and Ireland. Our future plans inc include to increase our market share, that is um, reach out to more households to buy the smaller devices, that is the 20 liters per day. Um, we are also looking to working with, you know, off-grid hospitals, off-grid restaurants, uh, but most importantly, we are looking to working with micro entrepreneurs. These are people who own actually businesses or small businesses in these regions who um, can actually increase their, um, their product by including portable water into their business model. Uh, so we will have uh, machines either on rental model or pay as you go model. And we give these devices to these business owners or local business owners who in turn can sell the water to the local communities. So we are very excited about, you know, 
our time with Africa Prize from 2019, and we, are con we get continued support even to now. And we appreciate the help we got from Africa Prize, and thank you very much. The Higher Education Partnership is for Sub-Saharan Africa has been going for some years now and it's a programme that encourages interaction between academia and industry for engineering education to try and improve the relevance and the skills of engineering graduates. We've been funding 70 universities across Africa through a hub and spoke model where we have hubs in nine Sub-Saharan African countries and spoke universities feeding out from those hubs it's important to work with the uh, universities in other countries and also even within Uganda so that the benefits from the project are not just for Makere University but they are also for those other universities and, and uh, countries. When the students come in, they know a lot of theory but by the time they leave, they really appreciated what is practically done on the ground. The Royal Academy of Engineering UK has been supporting us through support of our academia industry collaboration. It's very important that students are oriented to the actual production processes, culture of working, and most importantly, the rules and regulations that govern production in a factory. So that once they have that during their training, they will have no difficulties adapting when they get employed into the industries. It's very exciting to see students who, they, they, they now work together in the teams, they, they will go to the industry and participate, and then at the end of the training period, you see people who are productive, and they, they go out there and do many things. We are a team that's looking at exploring water recycling as a solution to water use inefficiency, which is a crisis globally. So we decided to set up a system that consists of a constructed wetland right here, Water from the kitchen, which we call grey water, is directed to our system, treated efficiently and is to be released into a garden to illustrate the reuse potential, supported by the Royal Academy of Engineering. Problem-based learning has helped us to concentrate on the problem and develop practical solutions for it. Knowledge is a partner for, with the University of Namibia under the HAPSA project. Through this program, Knowledge took on staff and students for training and exposure to the industry practices. With the equipment and the books we've gotten from the HAPSA project, they can compete to any student in any foreign university, be it in the UK, even in the US. Uh, because we're currently using the same textbook, they are using the same kind of equipment. Even in the diagnostics, they are now seeing the physical equipment. And the interest in the cost has uh, already tripled since we got the HEPSA grant. So we've seen quite a lot of change as a result of this program. Clearly, much more exchange and dialogue between industry and academia, but also a much greater vitality in the student activities within the universities, as they really are much more motivated to build their skills for uh, really making a difference within their country, within their region and beyond. Hi, I'm Abio Dumus. I've been a professor of mechatronics engineering, and I'm the leader of the, of the Higher Education Partnership in Sub-Saharan Africa, also known as EPSA at the Federal University of Technology in Nigeria. Our project titled Artificial Intelligence for Clean Energy Development is one of the projects in Nigeria that is solving what is called the energy poverty. You, most of us, we know that the existing power system in Nigeria does not provide reliable and constant access to energy. Thus, there is serious energy poverty in the country. And this project aim at addressing the key gap responsible for that energy poverty in Nigeria. And the and this project, I foresee, he intends to strengthen stakeholder capacity to achieve sustainable development goal seven on affordable and clean energy in Nigeria. How has the Loya Academy of Engineering supported us? Uh, the Loya Academy of Engineering has supported this project via the HEPSA program in numerous ways. Number one, the financial support provided over a period of two years. 
we were able to be, we receive over 155,000 UK pounds. And the partnership is another thing that we also benefit, a partnership with UK and Nigerian University for enhanced capacity development and knowledge sharing across various higher institutions in what is called the Hub and Spoke Universities arrangement. Also, the academy supported us via networking opportunities. We, were, we, we, we actually enjoy networking online and doing physical visit to London some years ago, same on this project. And the funding received has enabled us to undertake some key, key aspects of solving the energy poverty in Nigeria. One, content development for clean energy course, mentoring for young academia and, and interns, and the immersion program where some lecturers have to visit the industry and industry expert also has to, uh, they have to visit the university. And this one has also led to a concept that we call academopreneurship, which has enabled us to turn academic ideas into business ventures and startup. Uh, what are the key achievements I can, I can share with us from this project? Number one, the, one of the major key achievements include the development of clean energy certificate course for democratizing clean energy knowledge in Nigeria so as to solve that energy poverty. And then again, introduction of immersion program for, uh, for stakeholders engagement which has also increased stakeholder skills in solving that energy poverty in clean in Nigeria. And then graduation of 53 academies and the provision of enabling environment for the proliferation of academies in Nigeria. Of what impact has this project been? Number one, the project has created so much outputs and great impact among which include one, the high enrollment of, of, of people, of learners into our clean energy certificate course, and then high completion rate, and then the improvement of employability of, of our graduates. They, they don't have to wait for the nine to 12 month period before getting something tangible to do now. It has been cut short to three to six months, and we continuously have requests for, for, for interns under what we call the production of, e, of industry fitted graduate and also the for the facilitation of the long-standing industry industry academic academia relationship under what is called the quadruple elix for our cadeau premiership project the ia for c project will be sustained through one continuous stakeholders engagement for the achievement of 10,000 certified clean energy Nigerians with the right skill and ready to solve the energy poverty in the country. Commercialization of the developed product is another way we are looking at and the issue of intellectual property generation and ownership. And much more again, we are looking at continuous engagement of, of industrial partners and funding from, from various ministry department and agency. And I'm happy to tell you that we have an agency that have committed over 40,000 UK pounds for the next two years so that we can be producing academics with the right skill and graduate that will be solving this energy poverty in Nigeria. Thank you for listening and let me hand over to the MC for the continuation of the program. Thank you. Thank you so much to all my panelists. That was a wonderful set of presentations. And now we know a little bit more about the amazing things you're doing across the African continent. And we'd like to take a little, this, uh, this conversation a little bit deeper with um, Aditi, uh, Beth, as well as Musa. Uh, remember, before we do that, if you do have any questions for any of the three presenters, please add them into the Q&A box and we will be able um, to then pose these questions to our panelists. 
And now to our panelists, we'll break um, our conversation into two of the panel um, discussion into two. The, we'll look at gender um, equality and we will also look at impact. And I can see some of the conversations coming through um, our Twitter. Uh, Waya Kenya says, an interesting question would also be, how do you empower female engineers to build competency in a space largely occupied by men? And I'm sure Aditi, you would be able to answer this question in line with what you're doing um, with Women Hub and with what Wom Hub and Wom Eng as well. So tell us, what are some of the barriers to getting women into engineering? Aditi, let's kick off with you. Great, thanks, Terian. Um, and so uh, a, a little background around our Africa Catalyst project as well. Africa Catalyst, between 2018 and 2021, we worked with women in engineering bodies across seven African countries. Um, and across all our conversations, one of the biggest barriers that are holding women, girls and women back is, uh, is the fact that Africa still has very much a patriarchal culture, a stronghold of that, which influences many aspects across uh, from the time a girl is five years old and getting excited about what she wants to become when she grows up all the way into industry and ownership of the industry. Um, and so patriarchal uh, culture, where typically the male is the head of the household, affects uh, a lot of the aspects that women consider when choosing a career. And so perceptions, attitudes, and historic gender roles often limit women's access to education. Um, how that feeds out into some of the key factors that we see come out often is societal and cultural beliefs about engineering. And we often consider engineering in very traditional roles versus how engineering is actually evolving right now and how do men and women fit into those roles. Uh, another factor is around girls' education. In Africa, it's often valued less than boys and this plays to the patriarchal culture of boys are often considered one day going to head households. And so their education is often valued more than that of girls. Um, and thirdly, sometimes we also have limiting mindsets across from women. Um, and so how do we empower women enough to believe in themselves and their potential to make uh, an impact uh, within engineering and technology? Thank you, Aditi. Professor Musa, I'd like to rope you into the conversation now. What has your university done to attract more women engineers? Thanks a lot, Teriadi, for that question. In my university at the Federal University of Technology, Mino, Nigeria, what we have done include number one, we have what is called gender enrollment bonus. That is, we have opportunities specially created for females in, in STEM courses. That's the First thing, and then two again, we have what is called the STEM Cash Them Young. At the university level, we try to go to the community, encourage, and organize programs and activities that will and that will make females or females from rural areas and the nearby state to actually enroll in STEM-related fields. And then three is that we have special admission program for them. Uh, that one also allows them to favorably participate in STEM-related fields. And apart from that, uh, the university and our research group, we do partner with female-based NGO, where we co-organize co events, and we, we, we also try as much as possible to ensure that we sponsor some of them. And lastly, the university also has something like an endowment or prize to encourage females to participate in engineering. Like at every graduation or convocation ceremony, there are special awards for females in, in engineering. So that I can say that have been some of the activities or programs that the university have actually put in place in order to encourage female participation in STEM-related field. Thank you.
my apologies. Uh, my apologies there, I was on mute. Beth, do tell us what are one or two nuggets of wisdom that you have for aspiring female founders? Thank you, Terian, for you know such an amazing question. Um, I would say starting a company, and especially as a woman, is quite difficult. Um, and you know there are so many barriers to entry. May it be resources? May it be you know getting the required permits? May it be you know? And especially when you are in the engineering field, um, when you are starting something new, there are so many challenges, and it's quite difficult. Um, and the best thing I can I can say, and it took me long to you know have this, is you know do what you can with what you have uh, where you are, and then strive for progress and not you know perfection. Um, you can always perfect things as you go along the way, so you don't have to you know uh, start on the high end. You can start with just whatever you have. Wow, I like that. Do what you can with what you have. Let's look at impact now. Um, and Beth, I'll start off with you. In 2019, uh, you were shortlisted for the Africa Prize. What are some of the most invaluable lessons you've learned um, from being part of the Africa Prize? Um, so um, most of the things, um, I think um, the African Prize is uh, almost a year long program. Uh, so basically you build a business with this program. Um, and one of the things um, among many, uh, it's, you know, the one that is key for me is building relationships, uh, whether with experts or with fellow entrepreneurs. We still meet for drinks with the Kenyan entrepreneurs and talk about our companies. And we met in 2019 during this program. So it's something that has helped me build relationship. I still talk to some professors in UK who I met along the way. Um, so for me, it's mostly building relationship, um, but you know, also you get a bigger picture um, of where you want to see to go. Uh, you don't have to limit yourself to East Africa. Um, you can do expansion to other countries. It's not that difficult to like have a market in the UK. Um, so some of those are some of the things I got from this program. Thank you, Beth. Um, Professor Musa, you're part of the Academy's HEP um, Sub-Saharan Africa program, which promotes Africa-UK University collaboration. Can you tell us more about the uh, partnerships you've had with UK universities and how have they supported the project? Thanks a lot for that question. I can say one of the key aspects of this EPSA project is that partnership. The partnership has really enable us to collaborate with UK University, especially, let me mention, Manchester Metropolitan University. And during the program, we had what is called mentoring session for both academia and for both lecturers and students. During that session, we had lecturers, students interacting with colleagues from UK, where knowledge was shared among participants. And apart from that, we also jointly develop project and proposal for funding. And apart from that, we organize various sessions on proposal development, publication, and, and also assessing grant. Apart, in addition also, we had VC to Manchester University where we were trained on some of the equipment and the facility, and especially on digital trade technology. So the partnership has really assisted us to develop our capacity, both for lecturers and for students. And it has also enabled us to learn some of the recent technology and approaches and what are those things that the funding agency or funders are always looking for when it comes to research grants. So the partnership has really empowered us and in, in at Federal University of Technology and, and, hold, and also other participating university through the Hub and Spoke University arrangement under the EFSA program for our project tied to artificial intelligence for clean energy. Thank you. 
Thank you, Professor Musa. Aditi, how has um, being part of the Academies Network helped uh, women to address their goal of getting more women into engineering? And we're seeing that this is a question that is being asked um, quite a bit, both online on the uh, social media conversations as well, on the, as, well as on the Q&A tab. Um, so being part of the Academy's network has really created a platform for us at Women to amplify the voices on the ground, uh, to raise the profile of women in engineering and showcase the work that we're doing uh, across the world, across multiple levels of stakeholders um, and share that impact from a, an African voice as well. And so for us, the network has provided valuable insight in a, as we love to uh, frame it, a thinking global, acting local perspective, um, and really amplify people's voices across the world uh, to change narratives around women in engineering. Thank you, Aditi. I've got a question for um, all of you panelists before we open up into the Q&A, and I can see that we've got quite a lot of questions. Um, in your opinion, what else can the Academy do to support engineering on the continent? Let's start with you, Beth. Thank you, Karen. Um, so one of the things I was looking at is, you know, how can the Academy help companies um, that are engineering based? Um, and one of these uh, ways that they can help them further is, um, you know, companies reach a point where they are in this awkward uh, stage. Um, you want to scale, uh, but you don't have enough finances. Um, so you need to raise investment money. So this is a very awkward um, stage to be as a company because you don't have enough uh, finances to pay for, uh, this high level expertise, uh, but at the same time, you need this high level expertise when you are raising your first investment capital. Um, so offering that support in this awkward stage of a company will really help, and especially engineering companies because, um, and especially hardware um, engineering companies because uh, most of the time you need a lot of finances a lot earlier. Um, maybe you don't have like millions of customers, you have like few hundreds, but there's need for expansion. Uh, so offering support in such kind of uh, stages for companies would be very, very crucial and helpful. Thank you, Beth. Professor Musa? Okay, thanks a lot. In addition to what Beth has said and then what Professor Uloni Shaki also mentioned, I want to emphasize just two things that I think the academy can actually do in order to, to actually increase this. One is that there should be opportunity for for more co-supervision at uh, at postgraduate level between African universities and UK universities. Joint project supervision. That is one. And the second one I will also want to mention has to do with award and medal prices. Uh, when you look at the academy, there are a lot of award and med and medal prices maybe for UK, UK researchers and academia. But if they can also try as much as possible to replicate numerous ones across Africa, I think it will, be, it will go a long way to motivate Africans in doing more. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. Um, Aditi, let's come to you. Yeah, um, so something that the Royal Academy of Engineering is doing amazingly and continues growing is putting gender diversity, uh, equity and inclusivity on our agenda throughout whatever thematic areas we talk about. So when we talk about environmental, social, economic issues, gender diversity goes across the board. And so for us, it's about pushing gender diversity, not as a sideline item, but part of the main agenda across how do we create sustainable development. I think that's one of the most important things we see uh, in terms of organizations and individuals pushing forward in terms of creating equity, creating inclusivity and diversity is really around treating this topic as central to everything we do around sustainability versus it 
been a, a sideline item. All right, thank you so much. Uh, we'll open it now to questions from the audience, and I can see there's quite a number that has come that have come in. Um, Gemma uh, asks this question to Beth. Um, hi, Beth. What first made you apply to the Africa Prize, and what support do you still receive from the Africa Prize program? Um, uh, thank you, Gemma, for that question. Um, so the reason why I applied for African Prize is uh, basically getting that kind of mentorship from world class engineers um, and having access to all these huge uh, pool of expertise. Um, so that was my number one. Um, and that is something that I have continued to receive up to now. Um, whenever I need something or, you know, assistance um, when it comes to technology or even like the business um, expertise i do get um i do reach out to africa prize up to now and that i still get up to now all right uh, thank you so much we've got a question uh, from eileen to professor musa can you explain more about what the immersion programs entail okay thanks a lot for that question yeah the immersion program is divided into two we have what is called academic immersion program and then we have what is called industry immersion program. For the industry immersion programs, that one allow lecturers and students to have experience in the industry. They go on secondment for, for the students is for a period of six months. Why for lecturers is for totally a period of one year. But it's not that during the whole one year, they will domicile at the industry. They can plan their calendar. So what are those things expected of them during that one? One, is, one has to do with skill development, two, two has to do with joint project development, and then three has to do with research and product development. For the industry expert to come and lecture, visit, supervise work, and participate in project, we call that one academic immersion Program. During that time, we have industry experts visiting us in the university and sharing knowledge. And not only knowledge, also mentoring some of our students and also participating in curriculum review. And then we have what is called IHIP for us Industry Immersion Program for Students. During that period, students will be seconded or do, do what is called immersion into industry flow and they participate in product development during that program under the supervision of the industry expert. So that is what the immersion program is all about. And it's basically designed to increase to to actually increase the skill set for graduates and towards what you call the production of industry fitted graduates. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Prof. We've got a question for you, Aditi. Um, how can stronger institutions encourage women to pursue a career in engineering and keep them engaged? So an interesting topic and perspective that we took in Africa Catalyst as well is we often talk about career development. And I, I love this uh, profound saying where it talks about how we expect women to uh, develop their career as if they don't have families and to, to grow a family as if they don't have a career. Uh, and so when we talk about our career development, we cannot then not talk about domestic life, our responsibilities. How do we bring other partners into um, supporting our family responsibilities that have historically relied on women to support households? And so when we talk from an organization perspective, it's around including men in the conversation, including uh, policies and frameworks that create more support in the household as well. Uh, as in your career development. And so it is about creating holistic people within organizations and being able to see career growth as well as balancing family life is something that women still face. Um, I know there's many research uh, projects going on, 
around, especially during COVID, uh, women were taking on 2.8 times more of the household responsibility from healthcare, taking care of the family, uh, homeschooling kids, all while being on a, on a video call, keeping their day job going as well. And so when it comes to organizations doing more, it's really around how do we support outside of work equally and bringing men into those conversations, bringing men into the, the family responsibility as well. Thank you, Aditi. Um, Beth, uh, we've got a question here that seems a little technical, but I think it's quite um, curious as well. I'd like to know the answer. What is the approximate cost of water per liter that magic water devices achieve that's including amortization of equipment. It's a good milestone for comparing alternative technologies. Beth? Um, so um, I have two part answers to this question. Um, first, uh, remember we work in arid and semi-arid regions. Um, so alternative water sources are quite limited. Uh, so we are talking about, you know, borehole water, and also you have to look at the quality of that water. So most of our arid and semi-arid regions, um, you know, is in, most of the parts is in the Rift Valley. So there is high levels of fluoride or magnesium. Uh, so, uh, so those are the kind of water alternatives uh, we are talking about. Uh, but in terms of cost per liter, right now, the magic water device is at 12 shillings. That is per liter, and this is, um, um, I don't know how much when you convert to British pounds, uh, um, probably around um, how many cents? Um, like, you know, seven cents? I'm not so sure. Um, but, uh, you know, and looking at, also look at the regions where we work in. We work in like the Northern Kenya, the Eastern Kenya, um, so also it's always good to consider, you know, the kind of uh, regions that we are working in. Mm -hmm. oh, wow. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, Beth, uh, Prof will come to you um, on HAPSSA. Has it been challenging to engage industry partners? And if yes, how have you managed to overcome the challenge? Thanks a lot for that question regarding the quadruple helix. First of all, we implemented the, the collaboration in form of what is called quadruple helix. We have the academia, we have the industry, we have the government, and we have the community because you cannot be developing solution for a community without their involvement. So how has it been challenging is that, first of all, let me quickly give us a bit of the background the whole idea was totally not in existence when we started the project. But what exactly and how did we achieve this or solve that problem? We, we did what is called tough industry. We lied to them, approached them, and then discussed with them that, okay, this is the dream. We want collaboration, that we have a lot of projects that are lying on the shelf in the university. And what are those things and what are those things or how are the ways they can benefit that one? If we jointly develop this project and we move it from laboratory scale model that we are used to and we develop it to market ready prototype, they will actually assist in the marketing of it and, and then in the production of it. That's one way. Number two is that most of them need hands of skilled people to actually work for them. We try to convince them that, why do you have to wait for them till they graduate? And you now organize a short program called uh, graduate training. And then that one costs you a, a bit of money. Though the cost is passed to the consumer, but if you participate, if you participate in this scheme, you can have them train while they are still on campus. And you have them ready for your industry. That's why we call them industry fitted graduates. And also for some of the products that you have, training them, equipping them with the necessary skill will really prepare them to solve the society problem. So that's how we try to convince them. And we started with three partners. And, and as at the time 
we completed the project, we had over nine, nine of them. So it's more or less of advocacy and telling them the good side of it and why they must participate in order to solve the energy poverty problem in Nigeria. Thank, Thank you, you Prof. Um, Aditi, we've got another question for you, and I'd like to combine two of them um, because they do revolve around the same um, issue. How can you change girls' perceptions about STEM subjects? Are positive role models the solution? And then we've got um, somebody else who asks a question about how you identify talent. So maybe touching on the first one and our experience is um, the way girls grow up, the way we raise girls versus the way we raise boys is when you look at young kids is you often talk about boys being rough and playing and breaking stuff. And then you talk about girls being pretty and perfect uh, and princesses. And so it starts from a very early age in terms of the perceptions we create for girls. Um, we need to start allowing girls to break more stuff, uh, to play around, to test uh, and explore as well versus sitting up, sitting up, being dressing up pretty. It's about exploring, it's about teaching girls that science and technology is not something to be feared, but rather something that they can go adventure with, explore, uh, find problems in their community that they want to solve with these new new technologies uh, and I think often we don't associate that a lot with girls and so it limits their belief in what they can do as well. Um, and then answering towards the second question about attracting talent is it's about being able to understand and maybe you can give me more context here when we talk about attracting talent, we talk about it at various inflection points. So getting girls excited about a career in engineering and technology, uh, getting women as they enter industry at a university to sustain their excitement and motivation to be in the industry. And then when they are in the industry and owning companies within STEM as well, how do we make them thrive throughout those points? So as we attract at each level, it is very much different mechanisms, uh, but it's also around changing narratives uh, around what does it mean for women in these spaces. We often hear stories of many women uh, where they work on site, work in factories, and to this day, many of these factories don't even have toilets that cater specifically for women. Um, and so when we talk about attracting women in these spaces, we also need to talk about the environments we're creating for girls and women to thrive in them. Thank you, Aditi. Um, Beth, we'll come to you. Um, and Georgina is asking, is there the opportunity for product and business development support? And I'm assuming this is based on your experience with the Africa Prize and how that has impacted your business from a product and business development support perspective. Beth? Yeah, um, so um, I don't know if I got the question correctly, um, but the question was, is there opportunity for, um, pardon again, for business? Product and business development support. Um, yes, definitely. Um, uh, like I mentioned, uh, different companies have different stages and different stages require different, you know, uh, kind of uh, experience that you get and you need more knowledge when you reach a certain point. Um, I would say, for example, right now, uh, Magic Water is raising um, uh, investment and, you know, it's a whole, you know, world uh, here. So there's always opportunity for business. We seem to be having some technical um, difficulties there. Professor Musa will just quickly come to you. Um, we do have okay. a question. 
on how someone can get involved in the projects that you have within the university. Okay, thanks a lot. It is very easy to get involved. We have our website. You can actually write to us, email us, and then we will explain within 24 to 48 hours. We can assure you that. And also, how, how you can also get involved, very easy. We are presently doing what is called Nigerian University Research Group Association. So we are trying to provide an ecosystem for some of for the sub groups in Nigeria. So you can also join through that platform. Or basically, we are hoping for collaboration, networking, and especially for capacity development or staff exchange or student exchange as, as, as it relates to clean energy. So two ways, by email, handling us, or visit our website and you get necessary contact detail there. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor. And with that, we've come to the end of our panel discussion. And of course, the end of the, um, the session, I'd like to thank my panelists, uh, Beth, Professor Musa, and Aditi. It has been an absolute pleasure to just listen to all the amazing things that you're doing and we want to wish you all the very best. I do know that some of you might stay with us to the, to, um, for the afternoon session. And for those of you who will uh, not be able to, I want to say thank you very much um, for making it to the session. I also want to thank the audience for joining us today. And I hope that you are feeling as inspired as I am uh, by what you have seen and heard today. And after today, we will be able to send you uh, all a feedback survey on what you thought about this year's Africa Showcase. The survey will take just a few minutes to complete, and any feedback is, of course, hugely appreciated for the Academy to continually improve its events. Also, if you would like to learn more about the, Afri um, the Academy's Af Africa programs, you can continue to explore this online platform, which will be open until Sunday, the 6th of March. I'd also like to ask you to follow them on, to follow the Academy on social media, on Twitter, it is Rain Global. Um, if you follow the hashtag Africa Showcase, you will be able to get that handle as well. It's been a great opportunity um, to connect with our African community to learn how they have been supported by the Academy to deliver impact through engineering on the continent. For now, I'd like to wish you a wonderful, wonderful day. And for those of us who are meeting in a moment, thank you so much and see you shortly. <laughs>